We're starting our afternoon off with some very damp, very chilly looking impala. And of course, all rejoicing that we finally had some rain to break the drought that we've, or at least do something to mitigate the drought that we've been experiencing. Good afternoon, my name is Jamie and I have Brian on camera with me. On the other vehicle will be James and Vian. We're gonna see what wonders of the bush we can find. The impala are tucked away, as are most of the animals this afternoon. They're trying to find a nice, safe, warmer spot, slightly sheltered from the wind that's blowing. Let me see if I can find a nice position to show you. We're looking at the most numerous antelope species in the area that we're in. We're currently coming to you live from Juma and Arathusa Game Reserves in the Sabi Sands, which is in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. It's our largest unfenced wilderness area, a place where conservation has been occurring for the last hundred or so years. This has been a protected area where animals like this, and the impala in particular, have existed for hundreds of thousands of years. And as we sit and watch the impala, we're starting to just see them although they're very busy with their meals now. They're just starting to come into their rutting season. And Sarah was wondering whether or not I've ever seen of animals fighting, whether it was over food or what might be their motivation. And in the next couple of weeks, Sarah, we're going to see the impala seriously coming to physical blows, chasing each other around the big rams that have the large curled horns. And I'll try and find a nice example to show you are fighting each other for not food in this particular case, but for access to females. Oh, although it looks very green and very damp at the moment after our night and morning of solid rain, there's also animals coming into conflict at the moment over water sources. We've seen elephants chasing buffalo, buffalo chasing wildebeest. There you go, there's a nice big ram. To show you what I mean, that's a mature, could, uh, mature impala ram. In the next few months, when mating season comes along, an impala will have a mating season that is very set. It's at a very set time of year. And during that time, he will try to gather a harem of ladies. He will collect them together. He'll chase them and keep them from running away. And then he will fend off any competitors of a similar size. And it's only really when they're about four years or older and their horns are fully grown, as they are in this individual, that they are able to compete with each other for access to females. And as he'll collect a harem and keep it for about a week, during which time he will do nothing, he will not feed, he will not groom. He will just chase females and fight off other male competitors. And already last year's babies, to try and look for them, are almost the size of the adults. It's incredible how fast they grow. I'm going to continue on since our impala are hiding behind the bushes. I'll see what I can find. In the meantime, why don't you jump onto the back of James's vehicle and find out what he has to show you. Good afternoon, Mrs. Lassiter and Mr. Phelps's English classrooms. Very nice to see you. Uh, well, not see you. You can see me, of course. That is, in fact, not me in the picture. That is a bird called a crested barbet. And interestingly, sitting above a termite mound. And what it's doing there is uh, unsurprisingly looking for termites to eat. And we just saw a big raptor, which would normally be eating lizards or small rodents, fly up off the ground. But when the rich food source that is termites is available, what you will find is that lots and lots of different kinds of birds will come down and sit there and eat the termites. My name is James Henry. On camera is uh, Viam today. Hello, Viam. Viam is sporting a beard, the likes of which most hipsters would be extremely proud. Um, the other thing to note about that bird is that it is known as a frugivore, which means it is a fruit-eating bird largely. But as I say, when the rich protein and carbohydrate and fatty source of food that is termites are available, so the termite will, sorry, so the bird will eat the termites. Please excuse the English in the last sentence I used. It was very poor. Don't ever use it in the same way. Right, let us press along, see what else we can find. We did see some impala just up ahead. 
and we're hoping, well, we don't know what's out there today because we didn't go out this morning on account of the fact that there was a large amount of rain during the course of the day. That is very exciting for us, uh, but it does mean that we have no idea who was moving around this morning and who wasn't. So we will be, we will be looking at the road, seeing if we can find any tracks which are basically footprints or any other signs that there might be some animals about the place. There were lions in this area yesterday. Lions will move during the night, so I think it's unlikely that they're in the same area. And they will also move when it's rainy and miserable. It keeps them a bit warmer when they walk around. And last night we had a tremendous down about, about 60 millimeters, 68 millimeters of rain. Inches, that is roughly, it's almost four inches of rain which for this area is a massive, massive downpour. Going to the southern end of the property is Mahala erratic. Look, they're starting to fight. And Jamie was just telling you about them having a fight. You can see them running through there. The reason I don't want to go forward is because there's another interesting thing to show you. But here they come, here they come again. I'm not sure if you heard that, but it is a terrifying roaring noise. And if you don't know what that sound is and you happen to be walking through the bush on foot, as I found myself very early on in my guiding career, I thought I was going to be set upon by numbers of voracious predators who would want to eat me. But in fact, it was just the humble impala uh, who were rutting, of course, and they're rutting because it is coming into mating season and they're full of testosterone. Now there is a bird. The bird, the very bird that just flew up underneath that crested barbet, and it too was eating a whole lot of termites. And that is a juvenile, in other words, young battalier eagle. Now, the battalier eagle is a magnificent looking bird, uh, and in his adult form, he's a bit drab as a youngster. But I mean, you know, we all go through ugly phases of life. Some of us are still going through them. Not so, Liam. Indeed. And the battalier is a brilliant looking fellow. That's him there. He's at the top of the page there. And that's him as an adult, him and her. Beautiful red face, red feet, but you can see extremely drab as a juvenile. Now the battalier takes seven years, if you can believe it, to get to that adult plumage. And until then, he is that drab brown color. But the most interesting thing about a battalier is not so much how he looks, that tends to be the same as it is with human beings. The most interesting thing about this battalier is the way he flies. He has no tail. Watch carefully. It's going to go up now. Shallow wing beats. And he has absolutely no tail. Well, that one does. The adults have no tail. And it takes them seven years to learn to fly without a tail because it is such an incredibly unstable way of flying. So it takes seven years. Each year that tail just gets slightly shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until they're adults. And then it's just a flying wing. And it's incredibly difficult to balance like that. And that's how they fly. And that's given rise to their name, Batalia. My main goal to basically have a good time or be to raise awareness for wildlife. I absolutely see, Jada. Um, I think we're most effective as human beings if we're doing what we enjoy doing. And so I, that's why I'm out here. I enjoy being out in the bush. I enjoy exploring here. I enjoy studying nature. But at the same time, I really enjoy communicating with people through the medium of this lens. And I think that the joy and wonder of being in the wilderness is the best possible way to conserve it. That's how we will conserve the wild. Just let's find out what's going on here. There's something interesting. Okay, let's go across to Jamie. Signal's bad. She's got some monkeys. Oh, 
Now look very carefully and see if you can spot the velvet monkeys that have been hiding in the bush. I think that one that was sitting up there has just disappeared. They're running off into the grass. They are very nervous looking beings at the moment because it's so windy. They're like all of the animals. Their senses are a little bit compromised. They feel nervous and on edge. It's something we see with all of the animals on these cool, cloudy days. Now, an animal like a monkey is a really useful indicator. That when they sit up on the top of the trees like that, they've got excellent eyesight, and they alarm call at the pres presence of predators. Anything from a big bird of prey, maybe even that battalier that you were looking at with James, or leopards or lions, they'll do their typical monkey alarm call, which is a <coughs> sound that they make. And that's actually where their local name, Nkau, comes from, it's their alarm call. There's a lovely Indebele story about the wonderful and proud leopard. Now, the Indebele people are just a little bit further to the northwest of where, or the northeast, sorry, of where we are at the moment. But the story goes that there was a great challenge laid down because the animals of the kingdom found a big gourd full of liquor from the local village. But they didn't know what it was, so they all claimed that it was water. And the challenge was for the animals to be able to drink that gourd, so a big sort of pot-like thing, that liquids are stored in out here, be able to drink that in less than a day. And the proud leopard wandered across and looked at it and said, I'll be able to do that in two seconds. It's just a small drink of water. And he took one mouthful of this incredibly potent liqueur and he dashed off screaming and went to have a drink at the water because it was burning his mouth. And one by one, all of the animals tried, including the hippopotamus, and none of them could manage it. And finally, the little monkey stepped forward and he said, I would like to try, but because I am so tiny, Please, can I go and lie down after every mouthful? If I can go and lie down in the grass, just have a rest, and then I'll go back again. And he went forward, and he took a sip, and all the animals watched and waited. He walked into the grass and lay down for a bit. And then he got up again, and he took another sip. And it was only when the leopard, with his incredible eyesight, looked closer that he realized all the little tails of the different troops of monkeys were sticking out of the grass, and that the monkeys had tricked them into thinking that it was the same monkey going backwards and forwards to the gourd. And that, the Indibele people say, is why monkeys shout and call when the leopards and the lions come past, because to this day, they are afraid of their punishment for their trickery. On a rainy day like today, this is when the animals tend to hide in the thick bush. Now, Vader, Vader's asked a really quite an in-depth question, and that is what the one thing is that people should know about our animals in general, or about safaris in general, um, in terms of what we can show them and what they can experience out here. Vader? That's a really tricky question. I think that what people should realize, to me one of the most important things, is just how interconnected everything is. Everything out here has evolved alongside everything else. So the lions have evolved to hunt during the night to avoid us as apex predators. And the cheetah have evolved during the day to hunt during the day so that they don't come into competition with the lions. Certain tree species are pollinated by only one species of wasp and, and so on. So everything, even the grasslands, the shape of the environment, the trees that you're looking at at the moment are connected to the presence of elephants out here and the way that they push it through and the soil types. And the reason I say that that is such an important aspect, if I had to pick one thing that is important, and it's a difficult one to pick one thing, but if I had to pick one thing, that would be it, because that is why it is so crucial to protect absolutely and to value everything from the smallest millipede to the biggest elephant and the tallest giraffe and the most fearsome lion. They're all connected in a way that we're actually only just now beginning to fully understand. And our understanding of conservation as a whole has grown and evolved with it and changed in the way that we choose to protect and how we think that we are best protecting this incredible environment that we get to share. Vader, that would be my 
answer, but it's a very broad question. I think for me, I know that you asked James about whether our main purpose was raising awareness or for pure entertainment. And for me, one equals the other. Basically, I think for all of the presenters and for all of us, our primary love of the job that we do comes from being able to share our fascination and our enjoyment of this environment with others. There we go, that would be my one answer to your question. I'm going to send you back across to James, let's see what he's up to and I'll catch up with you soon. We've just come along here because we heard some waterbuck alarm calling. And we thought maybe there might be a predator around. So we're just going to reverse back. I'll show you the waterbuck. We'll keep our eyes peeled and see what we can see. The waterbuck are still looking due very startled. But let me turn around, then you can see them forwards. Predators, of course, will startle all sorts of animals, even if they are even if that they are too big for the actual predator that they've seen. So, for example, I think it's quite likely that these were in an, around an area where a female leopard was seen not too long ago. So, if these waterbuck, which we're going to see now, have seen a leopard, they will alarm call at her. They'll make snorting noises to warn each other, and. Even though that she she is not definitely not big enough to take a water a water buck like this, so let's just look at the water buck and we'll just sit here for a little while and see if we can hear anything else. There are the water buck. They look like great big fluffy teddy bears. Uh, they aren't, of course. They are an antelope species. And it's quite a large herd of them. And there's some more over there. Yeah. Mark, hello, you want to know how often it rains, Mark? One of the things about Africa is that its climate is massively variable. So the whole concept of an average rainfall on this continent is somewhat misleading. Um, you know, while we have an average rainfall here of about 550 to 600 millimeters of rain a year, um, sometimes it's as low as it has been this year. We've gone just over 100 millimeters now. And then, of course, it'll go all the way up to sort of a thousand millimeters in a really kind of wet year. I was just going to pan around here and see if we can't see anything with the camera. Anyway, um, so Mark, I mean, it's special that it's rained here because often it's dry. Often there's a, it's a kind of we, we're waiting for moisture. It gets very hot around the summertime, but it's so special this time around because we're in the middle of the worst drought since 1904. So the hottest summer in recorded history. Now that is quite something to say. And I think it's evidence of a few things. Firstly, that the world is getting hotter, as we know. And secondly, I'm just listening. Waterbuck is still looking quite carefully. Now they seem to have relaxed a bit. Anyway, let's carry on a bit. Uh, Mark, so to say how often it rains here is basically so completely impossible. It, you know, it will rain, it will vary so much that it's impossible to say. That said, we do know that during the winter months it won't rain. And that's probably from about the end of April all the way to September, October into spring, it won't rain at all. And then we're normally now, round about now, in the, at the end of the rainy season. So most of our rain should have come in January and February, but we've had nothing. So that's why it's so incredibly exciting that we had that huge amount of rain last night. Like I say, almost four inches worth, which for out here is absolutely massive. Right, nothing going on there. Let's see what else we can find. Ah, now, Sarah, you asked a very brilliant question, especially having looked at those very fluffy water, that water buck. You want to know how do they deal with the heat here? Well, Sarah, first of all, those water buck, their hair looks a lot thicker than it actually is. It's actually quite thin and sparse, so though it's long, that gives it its thick look. It's not very luxuriant at all, so they, they, they are not affected by their fur. 
But Sarah, they lose heat in the same way that you and I lose heat. They sweat, um, they stand in the shade, they go into the water if it gets too hot. And then they also have a sophisticated thing, and I'm not sure um, how, how relevant this is to your English speak, uh, your English learning, but they've got an amazing system called the carotid reti system, where the blood vessels coming out of the heart go into around the nose, and when they breathe in through their noses, that blood is cooled and it goes up into the brain and keeps the brain cool. There's a batelier, there's an adult batelier. It's actually not an adult, it's also a juvenile. You can see the way it flies, wobbling from side to side, very distinctive. So Sarah, those, those are the main ways that an animal stays cool, and a lot of them actually will keep their brains cool, and they're able to allow the rest of the body to get very hot, and Oryx is a brilliant example of that. So they can, their whole, their bodies can go up to 42 degrees Celsius, which is about, who would that be, about 109 degrees, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, which you know that as a mammal, your proteins will start to denature pretty soon after that but their brains remain at a sort of a crispy 36.5 or 37, 98 degrees Fahrenheit, which is of course the body temperature that you and I have, and that's kind of optimal for all mammals. That's how they stay cool, and I think cool is not so much an issue as is warmth for a lot of the animals. If we have, suddenly have a cold snap, uh, you can get an animal die off. So this rain would have been very difficult for a lot of the very small antelope to deal with. Remember, we've got new kudus, new water buck around at the, at the moment, and also we've got uh, lots of little impala lambs running around. So they would have struggled during the cold last night. Jamie's got some warthogs. Let's go and have a look at them. I do have some warthog, and better yet, I've got some baby warthog. Just on the right of your screen, behind the trees, it's a female on the left, and the rest of her family off to the right there. And hopefully they're gonna move into some clearer view. But in the meantime, since we've got her, they've somewhat unfairly, in my opinion, earned a reputation as being one of the ugliest animals. There's a little piglet there. And I know that many of you will have seen the Lion King, looked at a Pumba, and automatically assumed that a Pumba was a boy. But if you look properly, and you look at the number of warts on Pumba's face, and that's actually how you different, tell the difference between male and female warthogs. The females have only two warts on their face, the males have four. And I say warts, they're not actually warts, they're knobbly bits of cartilage and connective tissue. Come on, girl, let's go forward a bit. A clear view of another female. So Pumba is actually a female. Now at the moment we're being very careful about the places that we choose to off-road. We can't we can't off-road in many places and generally we only do that in a way that is safe and for only the high profile animals. And Mark was wondering about our trips through the bush. How do we ensure that our trips are, do not harm the animals in any way? And what sort of training do we go through? And it's a very important aspect of this, Mark, because essential to the animals' conservation is their appeal as a tourism draw. So the more people want to come and see them, to view them, the more money they will generate that can then be used in efforts to conserve them. But at the same time, as you said, you don't want to have an impact on them. And it's an important combination of training and experience and reading the animal's body language to make sure that you are not in their personal space. To say that we don't have an impact on them is completely unrealistic. We do to an extent. Our vehicle moves past them. It just so happens that after the as many years as these animals have experienced cars going past them, they've learned to ignore them, they don't bother them. But if, for example, we come along in the middle of a hunt, then we immediately switch off, we let the animals go about their daily business without trying to reposition to get a better view. You just have to let it unfold as it would naturally. And at night, we don't ever shine our spotlights on diurnal or daytime animals because prolonged exposure to the light is actually gonna take away from their ability to see in the dark. 
So those are a couple, just one or two of the things that we do, but it extends from everything to driving off-road. This particular area I'm driving in, there's no way I would even consider it after rain without doing considerable damage to the area. And you just make sure that you have a as much of a negligible impact as possible on the animal. And always an important rule, animals have a personal space boundary. There's a zone at which they are alert and uncomfortable in your presence. And you never want to breach, breach that distance. And on that subject, of course, we as guides, first and foremost for us, our ethics is most important and our love of what we're doing is most important. And Madison was wondering whether or not I've ever become attached to an animal. And I presume you mean in a wild context rather than a domestic context. Madison, yes, I have multiple times. I actually used to work in a much smaller area and I worked a great deal with rhino and I've got very, very attached. I've spent many, many hours tracking and following particular individuals and making sure that they were okay. So that is something that I've formed a major attachment to. And then of course now working in this particular area with the knowledge that we have from our viewers who've been watching the animals for years and years, I know they've formed a very intense attachment. It would be next to impossible for us to see these animals every day, to follow their stories, to follow their successes and their triumphs and their heartbreaks without forming some sense of attachment to them. But yes, it does happen. It's something that is difficult because once you do that and you name them and you form a bond with them, then you become intricately involved. Your emotions are entangled with what happens to them. And nature is both beautiful and it can be very cruel at times. So you have to face it. You have to accept that if you love nature, that comes with the losses involved as well as the joyous and wonderful moments as well. Like, for example, yesterday, Madison, just having looked at those warthogs, it was a very ill female warthog. And yesterday, we happened to bump into a male lion that pulled her out of her tunnel, out of her burrow. But she had already died. But it was just very sad to see. We've been seeing her regularly. She had two piglets. And Jalen was wondering, how big can a warthog get? The answer, Jalen, is pretty hefty, actually. Not much bigger than the females we saw there. Probably another a male would be about a third extra of that size. So if you're familiar with Staffordshire Bull Terriers, is what I usually compare them to, a, a really big male warthog would probably equate to about that size and weight. There's also a lovely story about why the warthog is so ugly. I personally don't think they're ugly, but there is a story about it. And it stems also from further north in Africa. And that is that the warthog used to be beautiful and very boastful. Got a lot of little impalas here. I'll try and find you a nice view. The warthog was beautiful and boastful and vain and he went out of his burrow one day and went to go and find somebody to boast to about how beautiful he was. And while he was doing that, the porcupine went into his burrow and settled down for a nice rest. The, the warthog found a male lion and he was parading around in front of him to say how gorgeous he was. These in parlor are also equally pretty. And the male lion was in a terrible mood and he finally lost his temper with the boastful warthog and chased him back to his burrow. And Warthog shot inside, face forward, and straight into the porcupine quills at the back. And from that day onwards, he was full of bumps and knolls and scars. And that's why the Warthog is no longer pretty. And also, why the Warthog always backs into his burrow, which they do, bottom first. Of course, in fact, the reason that they back into their burrow in that way is so that their tusks are facing forward and they can defend themselves where possible if there's any kind of threat to them. Impala, on the other hand, really can, you cannot argue with the fact that they must be one of the most attractive antelope species. Their dusky red color, nibbling away at the leaves. Now it's not just the big mammals that we stop for. One of the things you've got to enjoy is some of the little minutia that the bush has to offer. So let's have a look at the tiny little creature that James has found. Right, I'm standing here 
Well, I'm actually lying down on a castle of clay, so-called the termite mound of Macrotermes natalensis, the world's most astonishing animal, I believe. And there are lots and lots of termites here. You can see them. You might be able to see a soldier here. I'll try and bring him to you. He has got nasty little pincers on his, the front of his face, and he's there to defend the workers who are the ones without the pincers, and they've been building here, and they will do this after rain. They will start to build the mound like that. And this whole mound that I'm lying on is probably about mm, maybe 20 to 30 years old, and inside it is a queen, and she would have been replaced at various stages. Uh, she can live for 15 years, a queen termite, so that's pretty impressive. Now, what I will try and do is bring you one of these termites. I am, of course, taking a great risk by doing this because they do bite rather viciously. Ah! It's the best way to catch them, of course. That is a termite, and you can see that he is savaging my finger. This is deeply painful. Luckily, I am extremely brave, aren't I, Vim? Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. He's gone. I'll have to fetch him, put him back on his home. There we go. There we go. See, I am rescuing him. We'll put him back. So, the interesting thing about these termites... Oh, let go. Come on, now is that they are what we call fungus-growing termites. Now, most of the animals in the world, believe it or not, cannot digest plant material. So every grazer that you've ever seen, every horse, every cow, every deer, every moose, is unable to digest grass. Did you know that? And that means that they need help to do that. And the help normally comes in the form of bacteria in the gut. But now... These termites don't have that bacteria in the gut, so what they do is they grow fungus. They have gardens of fungus underneath the mound here that will help them digest that plant material. So they put the plant, they put their dung on a special garden, the fungus grows, and they eat the fungus, and that's how they derive their nutrition, which I think is the most amazing adaptation to surviving and eating cellulose and lignin, which are the two main substances that make up the structural parts of the plants. Right, on we go. Well, Lisa, you want to know how often animals attack us? Well, you see, I was attacked twice there by the same termite within just two minutes. And the only defence from that, of course, is to put the termite back in his home. Uh, Lisa, in all seriousness, there are, people tend to think of Africa as a dangerous place that we're driving along here and in fact the whole wilderness even the wilderness in the united states people think is being think of as being dangerous uh, crazy, crazy it is a dangerous place if you don't know what you're doing and if you don't know how to react to certain situations animals by and large in fact almost i would say 90 percent of mammals are not going to attack you unless they feel com tremendously threatened by you. That is certainly the case of just about every single African am animal, which means that unless you corner an animal, unless you really threaten it, it will leave you alone. What do we see here? Steerbok is unlikely to attack us. Sorry. Here we go, little antelope. Tiny little antelope called a stienbok. That's the smallest antelope we get there, weighing in at just over 20 pounds. You can see him there, he's very nervous of us. There he goes, brilliantly hidden, you can see. Very brilliantly hidden. I'll just move my microphone so that you can hear me a bit better. There we go, that should be a bit better. Um, so, by and large, animals out here will not attack us, as I say. And so, if people talk, I don't like to use the term aggressive, I don't like to use the term dangerous at all. And so, when we talk about animals out here, we talk about animals that do have conflicts with human beings as being threatened. Because we, of course, are the ultimate predators out here, which means animals are afraid of us. And because they're afraid of us, they become threatened and then they might attack. So, we don't get attacked. It's very unusual to get attacked. And if you do get attacked, it's normally because you have not read an animal's behavior correctly 
and you've stepped into the space where they don't want you to be. Okay, let's head across to Jamie, see what else she's got. And here we have two zebra, and it takes us back to Sarah's question at the beginning of the show. She was wondering about animals fighting. And while you were with James, these two have been ever so gently nipping each other on the neck. It's a very, it's not a very serious fight, but this is an animal that I have seen behave very aggressively to each other. They seem to have relaxed a bit now. Now it looks more like a little bit of a bonding session. But you very often see zebra with missing tails, and that comes not from an escaped from a lion or a hyena, but from other zebras biting them. They can be very, very aggressive animals. Typically, a male, when he sets off on his own and he gets big enough and strong enough, will go and fight another stallion for access to females. And if he manages to win that fight, then he will take the daughter of the stallion that he was fighting and start building up his own harem, so his own collection of females. And he'll slowly and gradually collect more and more along the same lines. There you go, ears back a little bit. You can read them just like you can horses. And those ears back automatically suggests aggression from their behalf. This is probably a bachelor herd of young stallions who haven't yet managed to collect their own females. And sometimes their fights can get incredibly vicious. Sometimes even the little ones can get involved. And Lorenzo was wondering, are we obligated to do anything where we see animals attacking each other? And if so, what would we do? And the answer is, we're not. Sometimes it can be incredibly difficult to witness, but it is our job to do just that. It is our job to witness and protect a way of life that has been occurring long before we ever arrived in this part of the world as, a hum as human beings even. And when it is a part of the natural order of things, it's, we just have to bear witness to it and allow it to occur. The only time you will find that we will interfere is where an injury to an animal has been induced by human, human actions, whether it is because they've been caught in litter, which is fortunately very rare in this area, or that they have become snared. So where people put out wire nooses to catch meat, catch antelope that they can eat. Occasionally it catches larger animals or something like a lion. Then yes, absolutely we are obligated to step in and intervene and help that animal out. And in of course the more serious cases of animals surviving poaching attempts, immediately there will be vets sent out and the absolute best care given to that animal as possible. But we cannot step in to interfere because it is so difficult to draw that line do you save a ze baby zebra from a male stallion? Yes, maybe you might want to do that, but then where do you stop? Do you rescue the impala from the claws of the leopard? What happens if that leopard has to go back and feed babies that night, feed her next generation of offspring? It's far too difficult and far too gray an area for us to interfere. We just have to let the scenarios play out as they always have. And at the end of the day, the animals balance. Um, as I mentioned, we're learning more and more about the way things interact. And that is all a crucial part. This the zebra's having such a good scratch. When you don't have thumbs, sometimes a tree will just have to do, especially when you have an itchy ankle, as this one does. I've never seen them scratch their ankle like that. I've seen them rub other parts of themselves, but he really is itchy this afternoon. Maybe from all of the rain, his fur is feeling a bit on end. You know, this one's now using it as a neck scratcher, now a shoulder scratcher. Sometimes there are just places where your teeth, teeth don't reach. He goes, now using it as a belly rub. Ticks, of course, loving the softer undersides of the animals, and all of the animals out here carry some sort of parasite. Here we go. And speaking from ex my experience with ticks, <laughs> it's amazing. They were all taking turns there to use that as a scratching post. Is this one going to join in? No. No, he's not going to. Three young stallions waiting for their chance to get big and strong. So the little, the little bit of sparring that we saw there, it's their way of practicing for the day when they will actually challenge 
another male for access to females. You can see how even at this short distance between us and them, and it's probably about 60 or so feet, how well those stripes work to start to obscure the shapes of individual zebras. Another scratching post, my goodness. Itchy again. Hey, boy. As our zebra disappear into the bushes, James has found, in my opinion, one of the most attractive antelope species that we have in the entire Sabi Sands. So why don't you go and have a look? I'm afraid the attractive antelope we found is absconded. There we go, Viam. He's just over there. He should be a small pinprick on your screen by the time we get... Well, there he is. That's called a nyale, everybody. And the most interesting and beautiful antelope we get out here, I think, simply because he is totally sexually dimorphic from the female. And, of course, all the antelope out here, the males generally have horns and the females generally don't. But in the nyala, the female is a rich chestnut colour, and he, uh, well, that small pixel you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, is a lovely sort of charcoal, chocolatey brown. Then off to the left-hand side of your screen, we have a giant herd of impala. I know you've seen these before today, but this is really just an indication of what an enormous herd of impala they are, or what an, and how, what a successful species they are. Lots of little lambs, lots of adults, but what you can see I'm just going to try and get into space here. Is the fact that they are now starting to show signs of distress as a result of the drought. They are skinny, their ribs are starting to show, which normally they wouldn't. And you've got to look a bit carefully if you want to see it. But you can see that their ribs are starting to show. One or two of them, their hips, are starting to show. And all the ruminants and all the herbivores when their hips start to show like that, you know that they are getting skinny and things are a little bit tough on the nutritional front. So they're going to struggle a bit. Now, this rain would have helped them. Of course, we've got to the end of the growing season, so there won't be a huge flush of grass as a result of that rain. There we go. Now, Nicole, you want to know if there are any sort of areas that all the animals seem to head towards. No, there aren't. There will be some seasonal migration around here, but remember that most of the water in the Kruger National Park is pretty fixed. And so, yes, animals will move to and from water, but there are no kind of specific areas that all the animals will move to, no. Remember, water is the limiting factor out here. Water is the one thing that none of the animals, well, there are a few of them, but very few animals can do without. And Parla, a great example of that. Uh, elephants, another brilliant example of animals that cannot do without water. And so they must drink every single day. And so in a, at a time like this, when water is scarce, they will all tend to move towards the water points that there are. But there are some sort of fixed water points in the private reserves where we are because an, um, animals, because the landowners do pump water for the animals. And that's obviously a, that's a, a fairly controversial practice as far as ecology goes. All right, we're on the boundary of our reserve now, and we were hoping to see if we couldn't find some lion tracks along here. Hello, Jerry. Jerry, uh, nice question. How far do we travel each day on safari? Well, Jerry, it depends again on the day. You know, sometimes where you started with Jamie, she was only about mm, probably less than a quarter of a mile out of the camp. And sometimes if you find lions there on the clearing, maybe you will only drive a quarter of a mile. You might just reposition the vehicle a few times. Then. Um, you might be where I am. I'm on the far eastern side of the reserve, and we can do up to, say, I would say not more than 15 to 20 miles during a drive. I'd say that's probably the maximum amount that we would ever do during one drive. But if you go to East Africa where the space is much larger, or you go north of us into the Timbavati, or south of us into the larger properties of the Sabi Sands, well, you can easily drive 50 kilometers, or what would that be in miles? Probably about, I don't know, um, 50 kilometers, must be 30 miles. So 30 miles in a drive, and sometimes even more than that.
right. Everyone from school, I hope that you had an interesting safari. I bet this is the best English lesson you've ever had. I believe you're reading Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. Enjoy it. I remember that from my school days. Enjoyed it very much. Thanks for your questions. It was good to talk to you, and I hope we'll see you again sometime. Bye-bye. We're going to go across to Jamie, and we'll see what she has to say. I actually personally read Things Fall Apart, but I have read some of the other Achebe books, and I do hope that you continue to enjoy your syllabus. But we come to the end now of the school portion of our Sunset Safari. As always, it's wonderful to have you guys on the back of the vehicle with us, and I hope that some of you will head home and actually join us for the other safaris that we do twice a day. I hope that we can inspire an interest and a love of the nature that we have around us and that we have to share. And on that note, I'm going to say farewell to the English classes of Mr. Phelps and Mrs. Latifa. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day at school. And maybe we will get to see you back on our vehicle once again in future. Cheers, guys. And onwards on our sunset safari, right to our regular audience. Hands up who wants to go to Treehouse Dam and see how much rain and how full it is. Brian's putting his hand up, I'm putting my hand up. That is where we're on our way because the rainfall last night was absolutely phenomenal. Totally, I mean, we knew there was rain coming, although there were some, there were some deniers. There were some, there were some doubters in the camp last night who were saying it was going to blow over and it was all a storm in a teacup and all of that. I was not amongst them for once. We had a bet going as to when the rain would start and my guess was at one o'clock in the morning. It actually started at, it, my guess was at one. Kirsty's guess was at three. Kirsty, of course, being one of our lovely directors. And she guessed it was going to start at three o'clock. And it turned out it started at 12 o'clock. And the reason why we have such an accurate knowledge as to when the rain started is because it started raining on Kirsty's head through her roof. So not only did I win the bet, but poor Kirsty <laughs> got drenched in the middle of the night. But yes, we are all rejoicing the arrival of the rain. The one thing I will say though, as we're driving along, is as wonderful as rain like that is, and it is wonderful, a huge amount dropped in a small space of time like that has done some serious impact to the topsoils. So it's washed away a lot. It's less noticeable where I'm driving here and more so sort of towards quarantine area. And you can really see the runoff that's come all the way from the top of the clearings down towards the dam. Quite extraordinary to witness. After we go to check on Treehouse Dam, as you can imagine, we've got something of a clean slate. Quite literally, there are no tracks. We'll be able to try and see if we can follow up on that incredible lion sighting that we had yesterday on the Sunset Safari. I came around a blind corner, for those of you who missed it, and I, he, was, he was charging out of the bushes, not at me, but he was actually on his way to find, which you'll realize in a moment, he was on his way following a smell, I think is what happened, because I came around a corner, you can sort of imagine it similar to this one, and all of a sudden I was just sort of almost eye level with a male lion, very much on a mission. And, on a, and three went, and both Dave and I got uh, jumped out of our skin, so did he, he was one of the Birmingham boys. And he just carried on straight, and I thought at first he was jogging from us, and that it was a skittish male lion from somewhere else. But he wasn't, he was jogging towards a smell, and he started to smell it as we got closer. And he dug up a warthog. Now I strongly suspect, obviously I don't know for certain, but I strongly suspect that it was that skinny female that we've been seeing over the last few weeks that has been so very ill with the piglets. And I think that she died inside the burrow and that the smell had attracted him. And he pulled her out and he sort of nibbled on her a little bit. And then the Ugoma lady showed up. good point so yesterday evening when he pulled the warthog out of the burrow there's one very very skittish wildebeest i don't think he's going to stick around i know you guys have been upset that we hardly ever see the wildebeest herd anymore sorry guys i'll get back to that in a moment 
There's the skittish male that lives in this area. He doesn't really want to be on camera, though. Probably going to find that reaction from a lot of the animals this afternoon. I think they had something of a terrifying night last night. Pitch black, no sense of smell, can't hear anything. Predators all about you. It must be absolutely terrifying. Yes, he went. The, the, this Birmingham boy went down to dig out the warthog. And he tugged her out, and you could actually see once he had her out and he started feeding on her, you could see where he pulled her tail off. And both Marlo and Tammy were wondering, if he pulled her tail off first, then does that mean she went into her burrow head first, or could she turn around? And my suggestion is that, yes, she went into the burrow first, and that she died there, and she probably was just feeling so ill that she just stumbled in and lay down possibly even died in her sleep. There are patches of warthog burrows where they can turn around, so it's not as though they are completely restricted in terms of the space that they can move around in. But I think that she probably was, she probably just went in head first. I don't know, in answer, for those of you who missed yesterday, in answer to your question that I know is coming, I don't know what happened to her piglets. When the lioness arrived that night, she also went and tried to dig inside the hole. I don't know if that was because of the smell of the wildebeest. I'm oh, sorry, I'm watching the wildebeest run away. The smell of a warthog, or whether or not the piglets were still inside, and whether or not it meant that they had maybe died. I honestly can't tell you. I'm very much holding thumbs for them. I'm almost glad, in a way, that that female warthog's suffering is over. She was looking terrible. Wow. Look at that. This is so exciting. I'll show you now what I'm talking about. Those of you who've been watching the slow sort of disappearance of Treehouse Dam, you must just have a look at this. Awesome. So much water. I'll go up onto the dam wall in a moment. I know how slippery it is up there, though, after it rains. So we'll go a little way, maybe not all the way across. I've nearly, I nearly slid down that side once before, so I'm less than keen to repeat that experience. Let's go have a look at this. we all have to dredge up driving about in the rain and on wet roads but this is what we would normally be experiencing at this time of year. Pamela was actually wondering, since we always talk about the drought, do we have a bad flooding problem and have we ever, has the Sabi Sand and the Kruger Park ever experienced a bad flood? The answer to that Pamela is you, if you ever go to Kruger you must see some of the flood marks. What they've done is they've marked the position of where the great floods happened in my memory over the last few years, sorry, just look at this dam. In my memory over the last few years, there was a huge flood in 2000. And then there was one fairly recently in 2013, with a couple of minor floods in between. Where I used to work, which is not that far from here, there was an absolutely enormous flood that washed away half of the lodges on the reserve that I worked at. The river went up, we would have been, at some of the river crossings, we would have been easily six meters and under. Out here, in this particular section on Juma and Arethusa, there are no sort of flowing rivers. So the chances of a river flooding up is unlikely, but the dams can certainly break their dam walls. As has happened at Ruyatela, clearly in my, from what I can see before, you can see that dip that we go through is a place where the dam wall has been has broken through and you get all of those erosion channels that run along it. I'm not going to go along this dam wall. I'm going to go backwards and across the other side. It gets very deceptively slippery after rain. The Pamela does happen. Apparently, the Milwaukee even flowed recently uh, due to the rains last night, so that could flood but it's unlikely to happen. It's more areas in, for example, the southern Sabi sands around the Sabi and the Sand River that you'll get the very serious floods. I 
we stopped at Treehouse Dam and had a look at how full it is, and I'm sure you're all wondering about the other dams. Luck as luck would have it, James has arrived at Buffles Hook Dam, so let's find out what that is looking like. The ocean blowing gunmetal grey under the steel sky. It's not really the ocean, everybody. It's Buffles Hook Dam, which until yesterday was Buffles Hook Mud Bath, and pre prior to that, Buffles Hook Dry Dust Bowl. Look at this. Isn't that amazing? Just three inches or four inches of rain, and this is what this has done. So a lot of this would have just collected here, of course, because it's a very clay bottom, so that will hold water. And some of it, I suspect, would have come down the drainage line. I think we had enough probably to cause a slight flash flooding in the drainage lines. And so much like with Treehouse Dam and with Juma Dam, I think that it will be largely as a result of actual collection rather than water flowing down through the drainage line, which is what VM is showing you. But I think in the case of this one, probably a bit of flow from the catchment area. Anyway. It'll be very interesting to see what happens here. Maybe a hippopotamus will come back. Of course, the great irony is that there's water everywhere now, and so the chances of a hippopotamus deciding that this is a good idea are uh, quite small. Anyway, I think it's really interesting to see it like this, and we haven't seen it like this, what, since November? Last ice age. The last ice age. Liam's lost his mind. Right, let's continue and see what we can see. Unfortunately, nothing is drinking here, and I've found no further tracks, but nobody has found tracks of the Inkahuma Pride since they were last seen last night. I suspect quite strongly that, well, I don't know what they did, because they were right on the boundary of this territory. They're right on the southern boundary. They were kind of in, almost in Styx territory there, and so I don't think they would have gone further south. So whether they popped up around here, I'm not sure. As I'm sure Jamie has mentioned when she was chatting about tracking, um, no, it was me that was tra tra chatting about tracking. The, the area is quite difficult to track in when it's like this because the tops of the roads are covered in a sort of crust after the rain. And so if you're a soft-footed animal, like a lion, you won't leave any obvious signs. Whereas if you've got sharp, pointy little hoofs, like a steenbok, for example, then you will leave very obvious signs. So it's quite possible, it's quite easy to miss the tracks of the pride of lions on roads like this after rain. But it's always fascinating to see. I, I was quite excited to come, I was very excited to come out this afternoon, just to see the change after all that rain. Ah, now, Diana, this is a question, obviously, from somebody in the Northern Hemisphere. Is there any chance of trees falling as a result of the rain? I'm assuming because, either because you think that there may have been some flooding, which would have inundated the soils and caused the rain, the trees to fall over, or because of the wind from the storm, or because the leaves become so weighted that they might fall down. Highly unlikely, Diana. Um, the soil here is largely quite sandy, but for in the dams, and so it will absorb the water very easily. The wind is, well, it was quite strong last night, but unless the tree is actually rotten inside, it won't push the trees over, and I don't think there was nearly enough rain to actually kind of inundate the trees to the extent that they might fall over or even lose limbs. So no, unlikely that it would result in trees falling over. Some wildebeest tracks there as I was saying, obviously hard hoofed animal. Unfortunately, doesn't seem to have been running from a pride of lions. Oh, beefy. Hello, beefy. Kant, you're in Tampa and you want to know about why perhaps there aren't animals drinking at the dams or they're skittish after the storm. No, cats, it's because they just don't have to go to the dams. There's water everywhere now. There will be puddles in every single block. And the animals, unless they're elephants, will be more than happy to drink from the small, dirty, muddy puddles. And so that's why you're not going to see animals rushing down, especially on a cool day like this when they would have hardly used any water. You're not going to have them rushing down to the dams. 
I think they are still a bit skittish. I don't think it's the result of the storm. I think it's the result of the fact that the weather still is windy and blustery and difficult for them to hear and see and smell predators. This buffalo is um, not particularly terrified. He's just not particularly accommodating. He obviously guards his privacy quite closely. Yeah. It's a nice buffalo. Continue along here. Oh, Jamie's got a nice raptor for you. We have a lovely raptor to show you. Somewhat soggy and drenched, as are all the animals of wasabi sands at the moment, including us slightly. But immediately that upright posture, sitting straight up in the tree in the slightly fluffy head, even if he is a bit puffed up because he's cold and damp, is a giveaway for a brown snake eagle. When you're looking at identifying birds and raptors in particular, you're looking at a general impression of the size and the shape. And with that comes the way in which they hold themselves. The snake eagles in particular tend to have an incredibly erect way of sitting, looking down for any potential prey. Now this weather will be a boon for the snake eagles and all of the birds of prey, only of course once the sun starts to come out because at the moment it's very windy, very cold and gray and flight is not all that easy when you're dripping wet. It probably has dried out a little bit. But it will, the weather will bring out snakes and frogs and insects and all kinds of things that will be on his menu. Definitely exciting times. If we're lucky, we might even see him preen a little bit, rearrange his feathers as they get fluffed up by the wind. And as most of you, I'm sure, know, as with all birds, and that applies across the, bird, across the world, they are covered, or they have special glands within their skin, known as preen glands, that secrete a special type of oil, which on rainy days is essential because it essentially waterproofs the little filaments of the feathers make sure that they don't become completely waterlogged because if they were to they would get very cold very quickly amazing how there's been a drop in temperature from yesterday's boiling hot sweaty weather to shivering and wearing a jersey and a jacket And Sunita, who's watching in Bangalore in India, was wondering just that, what kind of effect the rain will have on termites and birds and all kinds of things out here. And as I said, for him, it is going to mean maybe a day of sitting, may, remaining relatively perched, since there are no hot air currents to rely on, although snake eagles are less reliant on them than something like a vulture but they're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, so they'll probably spend most of the day perched up like that. You can still hunt, but for something like a vulture, a rainy day means a day on a tree. That is what it essentially comes down to. They can flap short distances, but they are adapted for nice warm days when the hot air currents produce thermals. So hot air rising up from the ground, the vultures can stretch their large wings out and soar upon the thermals without expending too much energy. But for all animals, eventually the, the rain is going to be a boon for them. The termites are going to come out en masse. We're going to be seeing more and more of the winged reproductive termites. And you'll probably even notice them tonight. Once it starts to get dark and we're driving around, they will be attracted to our vehicle lights and our spotlights. And we'll have another one of those drives where we're sort of pulling termites out of our hair and out of our clothes and off the vehicle. I can hear frogs. Sunita, the frogs out already. The tortoises will be coming out for a drink. Already the land snails have apparently made an appearance. I haven't seen one yet, but the land snails will be coming out. The reptiles out. The snakes will be out trying to catch the frogs. It will just be an exciting time for everything. And as soon as the sun comes out, we will notice he just took off, unfortunately. And where is he going to go? He might come flying around here. But the, the rain, the instantaneous effect once the sun comes out on the amount of greenery that the ground produces, the new fresh green grass shoots, we're right coming up to the end of the growth season for most of the plants out here. So this last minute rain has been absolutely 
awesome. I'm so grateful that we had it. And Patrick is just saying he can't wait for the sun to come out so we can see the grass coming through. And whilst this rain will not have fixed everything and it won't have completely, you know, it can't repair the damage of months worth for lack of rain, it still will have contributed greatly to potentially increasing certain animals' survival over the next few months. The fact that the dams have filled up as much as they are is an awesome start. We're all very grateful. We'll still be, we still have hard months ahead though. And Cindy, yes, there is more rain predicted. From what I can tell, it could start drizzling even into our sunset safari. I say that with great confidence, but I'm of course not very good as a meteorologist and I've learned to set very little store in the predictions that come through. But I'm, I'm fairly certain, judging by the temperature and the feel of the air, that there is more rain on its way. And it remains to be seen. I think it's meant to be cloudy for the next few days, whether that comes with drizzle or not. Now, typically, in a, on a normal summer, we would have easily a two-week period where we would just have almost solid rain in the same way we had last night. That's what happened two years ago, where the floods occurred. So it was slightly more than expected. But that is, that is a typical summer rainfall pattern, not this, not what we've been experiencing at the moment. We should have been having downpours like this maybe once a week, maybe twice a week. And that would have put us on a more normal level. Where well, we were just talking about animals that might want to come and have a drink. And here is one of the puddles that is filled up as a result of the rain. And that impala looks like it wants to have a drink, but I think it's a bit nervous of us here. It's completely normal, of course. Animals will be scared of us. And they will be very nervous to drink when there's anyone around. So they'll probably just wait for us to move off. And we had a wonderful sighting a little bit earlier. Um, I don't know if you were with us for that school drive where two rams were chasing each other. Now, the testosterone levels of these rams is starting to ramp up. And that means that they're going to find each other's company far less brotherly and much more competitive as the months, months go on. So, after May, when they've mated, then their testosterone levels drop their testicles actually kind of almost atrophy. They go back up into the body and they stop being aggressive males and they sort of form a brotherhood of bachelors. And then, round about this time of the year, as the day length starts to drop below a certain level, I'm not exactly sure which level that is, but somewhere around the middle of March, the day length becomes so short that their testosterone levels, that's what triggers an increase in their testosterone levels, and they start to get very cross with each other. And they don't want to be around each other anymore because, of course, they're competition for breeding females, and that will happen in May. So they're going to fight with each other for a good two months before they'll actually breed. Let us continue. We have not found anything of great import since I last saw you. Nasty wind. All the drongos there, Vim. James Richard, while we look at these drongos, you want to know what it smells like out here. James, it does smell refreshing after the rain, you're correct, but the main smells, the best smells, the kind of petrichor type smells, are going to come when the sun comes out after the rain. That's when we're going to smell the herbs and the grasses and that gorgeous smell, which is apparently a bacteria coming out of the earth that is petrichor. Now, with the wind blowing like this, it does smell fresh, but it doesn't have a very strong scent at all, and it's because this front that has delivered all this rain to us is still overhead. Are those wonderful drongos? There are about, how many are there? One, two, three. There are at least three of them there. And they'll be gleaning for insects. Now, what that means is, I mean, normally a drongo is a hawker of insects, so it'll fly out 
catch an insect in the air and fly back. Yep, there we go, it's exactly like that Drongo just did. And that's why they've got that forked tail. It allows them to be incredibly maneuverable and stop suddenly in the air, a bit like a swallow. But they will also pick up insects if they're on the bushes and on the branches of the trees. And I think that's what they're doing here. And they'll also jump down and eat like a roller wool, which is on the floor. See him sharpening his beak there. I'm sure that this little crew is probably a bunch of siblings. We've had enough of them. We've had enough of the enough of the drone goes there, Vim. Okay. <laughs> so I'm sure they were probably all born around this tree. Hello, base or face, I'm not quite copying. Um, you're a new viewer on YouTube, uh, base with a B. Uh, you're a new viewer on YouTube and you want to know how many different birds we have here at Juma. Base, uh, we have potentially about, I'd say a total list of about 300. Now, that will include about 50 vagrants. Now, a vagrant is a bird that comes into the area, it's seen once, and it disappears again. So I think you'd say you'd have a regular species list of about 250 birds, and it would go up to 300, depending on the year. In a very wet year, you'll get many more than you will in a very dry year like today, like today, like this year completely unlike today, but like this year, we've had a pretty, I'd say a pretty average birding summer. Uh, on a wet year, you'll get lots of different things that aren't normally here coming in. Um, things like the widow birds and white-winged widows and the red-winged widows, and that's always an exciting thing to see when you've got a big year like that, especially when there are grasses. And the grass plants, when they get big and they produce lots of seeds, attract all sorts of birds that wouldn't normally be here. So base, why don't you start keeping a list? Lots of our viewers keep lists. I think uh, the top one that I've read uh, is about 200 strong already. So that's birds that have been seen on live drive, which I think is really impressive. I've seen one or two others with uh, more species than that, but they tend to be works of fiction, a bit like J.K. Rowling would be proud of. You may, you may tick a bird if you hear it as well. There's a big water warthog ball in there. Well, he's big in so much that he's got an impressive set of tusks, but he's not actually very tall. Is he? Bim, can you get anything of him there? I'm not supposed to here. Really impressive tusks, but he's not a big boar, so I think he's going to be a monster when he's really come into his own. I always peer at those white tusks through the bush. The one thing I want you to notice there is the colour white and how easy it is to spot out here. You can see the grey. You can hardly see the grey of that warthog, but that little kind of browny white mane that he's got and the whiteness of those tusks, you can absolutely see. It does beg the question as to why on earth they should be white like that. Look how brilliantly hidden he is. That's brilliant. What a brilliant picture. <laughs> yeah, this is a... I have to compliment you. I think that's a really excellent idea of yours. Um, Helen, while we watch that warthog disappear... Yeah, he's a young boy. He's going to be really impressively sized. You want to know if there's going to be an influx of insects as a result of the rain. Helen, there will be once it warms up. There won't be while it's still cold like this. And cold, of course, is a t totally relative term. Um, and so we've got about probably a few days before the heat comes again. Then the insects will come out. And you want to know if the migratory birds will be able to have enough time to lay on some fat with that insect boon before they leave. Helen, it's very touch and go at this stage. I think that the number of birds that are about to leave, um, I think they're going to start going pretty soon. Mm, maybe end of the month. So certainly they're going to be compromised. Uh, will this help them? Absolutely, it will help them. Would it put them at the stage that they would have been uh, if we hadn't had a drought? No, I don't think it will. But it will definitely help them, especially if the heat comes. Remember, an insect is what we call poikleothermic or endothermic 
which means it's like a fish or a frog or a reptile. It doesn't, it can't make heat on its own. It doesn't make, meta well, it does make metabolic heat, but it can't store it. So it does depend largely on the environment. And an insect, you've all seen a cold butterfly. And if you're ever confused about this, go and catch a beetle or a butterfly and put it in the fridge for a little while and see, uh, not for too long, of course, put it in the fridge for a little while and you'll see how it becomes totally lethargic and unable to move. And the same has happened here. Of course, it's now got quite cold, or relatively cold, about 20 deg 23 degrees, apparently, a bit colder with the wind. And that means that the insects will be unable to move, or they will certainly struggle to move. And I found a beetle, well, I found about 74 beetles in my room today, and they could all, they were all just kind of limping about because it was a bit cool. And so they'll wait for the sun to come out, and then we're going to see lots and lots of insects coming out. And I'm sure there'll be another termite emergence, will be, which will be wonderful. Nice question, that, Helen. You're obviously an astute birder. Now, we are going to continue lurking around here uh, on the eastern fringes. I'm just going to keep trying to see if we can't cover all the roads in the east here and see if we can't pick up tracks of the Nkahuma Pride. Jamie, I believe, is heading towards the hyena den, so that will be quite fun when she gets here. I'll be fascinated to know what those hyenas are doing. And I've no doubt many of you will want to ask whether the cubs will be affected by the rain. I think I'm going to let Jamie answer that, in case you do want to ask her. Somebody's come down this road, which means... Uh, which means that I'm not going to do it now, because clearly there are no lines on it. This is a really cool question coming from Jack. Is there a risk that Karula's cubs may have drowned or become wet by the rain? Yes, there was a risk, and I was worried about it. Until Viem and I drove past where she was last seen with the cubs, and there were just we had to we had to drive over the road in order to get to the eastern side of Cheetah Cut Line. And there were some water bucks standing on the road. And we think she's got them in a culvert underneath the road. And they were standing around alarm calling, sort of trying to smell. They could smell something. And they'd look one side of the road and look the other side of the road. I'm pretty sure that those cubs are completely safe inside that culvert, and they're absolutely fine. I think she would have moved them out probably during the course of the rain last night and then put them back during the course of the morning when it stopped raining. I think that those water buck were deeply confused because they couldn't see any predator, but they could definitely smell the predator. Let's go across to Jamie and get an update from her. I'm just doing a little bit of a tour of the different dams. I'm actually slowly making my way towards the hyena den. That is my plan since it is so nice and cool and I was planning on getting there. Look at this, it's incredible. I was planning on heading there yesterday. Brian is grinning in the back as well with just how much water there is in the dams. It's incredible. So there you go. For Leo and Shannon, who also wanted to come and see Juma Dam, I'm going to do some, I'm going to have a look from this angle, which is close to where the pan or the dam camera is. And then I'm going to turn around, we'll go along the dam wall and we'll just have a look around there. You can hear frogs chirping away. Sounds like guttural toads as well. Take this point to just do a bit of a U-turn and then we can stop and observe what Juma Dam looks like. Well, there's, there's water in it which is the first time in months since it dried up. When did it dry up? It was about August last year that it went dry, August or September. Now we're looking at it with more water in it. That being said, in a normal rainy season, this water would extend all the way along and it wouldn't just stop there where it stopped. It would continue right the way along the drainage line. Just look at that. You can hear the buffalo weavers chirping happily away.
bird chorus is starting. And the pan in front of me, oh, he rolled into it. Pan in front of me, absolutely full of water without having to be pumped. Right to bursting point. Might even have overflowed at one point. And it just looks cleaner. It doesn't smell. Doesn't smell at all, does it, Brian? No, not at all. This is wonderful. That's a really good question from Sally because it's something that I've been wondering about. And I actually went to go and investigate Buffel's hook on that subject. So Sally was wondering how long it's going to take if the water stays in the water hole for the fish and in particular obviously the catfish and maybe even killifish if there are any in this dam. But for the catfish that when the dam dried out we spoke to you about the ability of catfish to bury themselves in the mud and to surround themselves with a wonderful it's a semi-permeable mucous membrane that allowed them to breathe but didn't allow them to dry out. And Sally was wondering how long is it going to take for them to pop back out now that there is rain in the dam, water in the dam. And I have to be completely honest Sally, I really honestly don't know. I'm going to speak to the other presenters about it and figure out if they know how long it will take or if they think that the catfish are actually going to risk coming out or whether they're going to wait until the proper rainy season next year. We know they can survive for up to a year, if not longer, but at least up to a year like that. And I was going to go down here, but I've just changed my mind, and I'll show you why. Just um, if we can have a look at what's happened to this road. The roads are completely waterlogged. Now that's one vehicle's passage through there. I don't want to add to it. Already I'm driving in low range just to try and minimize the amount of acceleration I have to do. So therefore the trenches that I dig in the road. I was going to go that way and I was going to show you the view over the dam wall, but my apologies, we're not going to add. They've just, they've just fixed this patch for everybody. I don't want to make it any worse. I feel terrible. That's just pure bad manners. They've spent so much time and effort making that lovely bump and bolster so that the water doesn't run down and wash through those erosion channels. But speaking of erosion channels and Pamela's question about the flood, this is where obviously the dam wall broke at some point. And those rivulets through the dirt and the sand. That's what, that was obviously caused at one point during a flood. Cat in Tampa. Cat in Tampa didn't even realize that the Juba Dam was meant to have water. Cat, as we drive along, we'll go past and we'll have a view of the lodge. And on a normal rainy season, the water should extend right up to the dam wall for a start, not sort of lap at the sides of it. And it should extend all the way up that drainage line towards and alongside Voyatella Lodge. That is where the water should be at this time of year, after a normal, and the biggest rains in my experience in this year, even though you have it fairly constant in a normal rainy season, my experience has been the biggest rains in the weeks of February and the beginning of March. And that's when the dams become really, really full to bursting point. So the, the water should extend way up to where we can see those dead trees sticking up out of the ground, if not further. And that's for Cat in Tampa, that's where the water should be. Interesting. It's a whole different world when it rains out here. Cat, the other thing that you would be seeing when we're on walks, when we're on bushwalks, or even just in this section here, there are parts of this place where the grass at this time of year should be at least up to my knees, if not up to my waist. Um, so to see it basically barely here, because this is where all the animals have come to graze and to feed, that should be knee high at least, if not taller, and filled with all manner of perennial plants and pretty flowers, bright red star zinnias, they would be on their way out now. Is there any water in here, actually? Let's investigate. Mm, puddles. 
here are some paddles in this little sea pline spot. Amazing. And as we leave Jumapan, Pamela was wondering what happened to Peter the hippo that we usually see in the pan. It's actually been a couple of days since we last saw him. My suspicion is that he moved on. There were two at one point. My suspicion is that he moved on towards Sydney's dam. He got tired of spending half his day with his back sticking out in the sun and was able to, because of the hippos that were removed, Obviously, there was therefore enough space for him to move in and to take advantage of that. When buffaloes have been passed at some point, the ground is all churned up. I'll try and show you when I see a nice point. You can see that the buffalo herd has been through here. Not the greatest light, but you can see it's not... There's patches where they've kicked up the dirt. It's not great light for tracking, this flat grey light. You can see the soil's been disturbed and you'll have to just take my word for it that it was buffalo coming through. And on, an, on the subject of Peter the hippo, who has now moved off and is no longer inhabiting the pan, an update on our friendly elephant, Mr. Asbo, who paid us another visit yesterday after my morning, I, sh I started my morning safari by just giving a demonstration as to what he'd done to the driveway before I chased him out so that I could leave. Um, he has now tried or attempted to step on the pool deck and consequently it is now broken. I think he learned his lesson though. He didn't try and move forward, luckily. He didn't try to carry on his movement. Let's sort of see if these Impala rams continue their little sparring session. The young boys over there were sparring, but they're now dashing off the, after the rest of the herd. My head. And Michelle was wondering if any of us have seen Nelson, as we are stopping to look at Impala. I haven't seen Nelson for a while. That being said, it feels as though every Impala in the Sabi Sands has actually moved in. There must be at least 200 Impala on Juma, probably more. They are just in parlor all over the stage. And they're doing some very interesting things. The hormones starting to increase, starting to get a bit more playful and play fight. I'm going to continue on my way to Bivol's Hook Cut Line and have a look at Sydney's dam. Let's find out which bird of prey James happened to find. Now, I think you've seen one of these already with Jamie earlier on, but this one, of course, is sitting dead still, and it is a brown snake eagle. And Obviously so, because of the big brown head that it has, you can see it looks slightly like it's got a head slightly too big for its body. And that posture it sits at is very distinctive, slightly leant over. And it's also, if you've got very powerful binoculars like mine, it has got a yellow eye. Very distinctive of the brown snake eagle. Also, no feathers down to the feet. Only the true eagles have got feathers down to their feet. And I remember I said uh, I accused the bald eagle in America of not being a true eagle the other day. And uh, Twitter nearly exploded with tremendous objection that I had cast dispersions on the character of the bald eagle. Um, no, 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 I didn't do that at all. Uh, when we say true eagle, what we just mean is that they belong to a certain genus or a very closely related genus of specific kind of eagle. So please don't worry. The bald eagle, magnificent bird, and uh, very closely related to our fish eagle, uh, is in fact an eagle. Don't worry. Oh. So, Lael, when we look at that bird there, you ask the astute question, can you tell the difference, can you tell if it's male or female from its size? Lael, you can if you see them together. I wouldn't have the first clue whether that was male or female. They're only a centimeter or two different, or maybe sort of mm, 250 grams, so 
less than an inch or up to an inch in difference in height. And at this distance, I mean, it would be almost impossible to, to tell. I have no doubt you could find some people who try and tell you that they can tell whether that's male or female, but no, I couldn't. And sometimes the eagles are exactly the same size, the male and the females. But as you say, Lael, as with many of the US eagles, the female is often that it was an alarm call. The female is often larger than the male. And there's one mammal species out here that does that. I wonder if anyone can tell me. Oh, no, there are two mammal species. The ones you're going to see with Jamie just now, they are of the obvious example, but there's a little antelope. And that's the dicat. The female is bigger than the male. And I'm not sure why that should be. They certainly don't live in a society anything like the hyenas. They're totally solitary. So it's interesting that the female should be slightly larger than the male. We're going down into the Umlulwati drainage line now. And we're going to check one more road in the east of the property before we head further then to the west. And we might pop over to Arethusa and see if we can't get some kind of an update from them. But I didn't get anything on the little WhatsApp group that we have going at the moment, so I'm not sure what will happen there. James, Richard, a very good question. The animals, you say, don't seem as playful as they normally would after the rain. Hmm? Something smelling. Something smelling. We almost smelled something that has expired. James, you're absolutely correct. It is because of the color and not the color of the cold. It's because of the cold and because it's still blustery and still rainy. When the sun comes out, then you will see that playful behavior. Let's just have a smell, everybody. Take a deep breath. Close your eyes. Go. I think we're quite close by to where Jamie saw that lion yesterday eating the hapless female impala who we think has died. Well, if it was the one that the lion was eating, she definitely died. So maybe that's what the smell is. We'll just pop out over there, and then maybe we'll do a little trip down the river and see if we can't find what they're smelling. It's not very strong. It is a very subtle kind of rotting flesh smell on the air. And I don't know if any of you have smelt rotting flesh before. It's not, um, it's not sort of the Chanel number no. five. You don't want to be smelling it. Uh, but it is a very good indicator, perhaps, of, oof, that is powerful, of predators. I wonder... That warthog didn't live very close by here. The other thing that, of course, can smell like a carcass is an elephant's, not an elephant's, a lion's dung. So we'll just ease our way up here. We Not far from that area where the warthog was killed yesterday, or died of natural causes and then was fed upon. Just do a little loop around here, then we'll come back down into the drainage. And I said at the beginning of the drive that I didn't think it was likely that the lion was still around here. It was quite a cold day, and I think they would have moved in that big storm we had last night. Yeah, I can you smell it anymore, Bim? No. No. I think probably down in the drainage line, and if I'm not mistaken, I mean, that kind of smell is born of particles in the air which will probably be heavier than air, which means that on a cold day like this, they will sink down into the drainage line areas, as opposed to float upwards. So let's go back down there. I see no tracks of any predator around here. Our noses, you know, they're not quite as good. Well, I mean, they're not nearly as good as the animals out here. But you can train your nose to be a lot more useful than you think it actually is. And especially, and this is one of my favorite topics, especially when you are talking about our own human interactions. 
I find um, the, the smell of other people so distinctive. It really does affect the way I interact with people. <laughs> How do you say you can, you can smell your soup? Dada, I hope your soup smells a bit better than this rotting flesh that we can smell around here. If it doesn't, I would suggest you toss it out and make a new batch. Let's do a little drive down the drainage line here. So what could it be? It could be the, that warthog, it could be the remains, it could be dung from one of the lions that was around here yesterday. It could be that a leopard has stashed something in a tree around here. We're in Karula's territory, we're also in Mvula's territory. Maybe he's uh, decided to come and pay us a visit. Maybe he's stashed something up here. The only thing is that if it's smelling like this, it would have been killed yesterday because it wouldn't have become putrid in this kind of weather. And so I suspect that if it was a leopard, it may have been spotted here already last night because there was lots of activity around here yesterday. Any ideas, Vian? There's a bird flying away. So I think that was the brown snake eagle. We're not far from there. No alarm calls, of course. Let's just stop and have a smell. Had to take a deep breath. No, it doesn't smell here anymore. Okay, let's go the other way. The wind, of course, is blowing from the southeast, so that's basically straight down the front of the drainage here. So we can't smell it here, it must be behind us. Rusty doesn't want to turn today. <laughs> Katie, you're in South Bend, Indiana, and you're our second viewer from South Bend, Indiana. Do you know Lucy from South Bend, Indiana? Um, Katie. Sorry, I actually missed your question. I was so overwhelmed by the second person I know from South Bend, Indiana. Oh, right. Now, whatever the warthog died of, could it have been passed to the lion after he ate it? Katie, yes, in theory, it is, it is possible. I don't know what that warthog died of, though. I mean, there are some diseases. Uh, rabies is one, for example, that warthog didn't have rabies, but rabies is one that can certainly be passed from um, uh, something like a warthog to a to a, a carnivore because it affects all mammals. Uh, but if it was something like um, the equivalent of bovine tuberculosis, it could also pass to lion, probably wouldn't affect it. If it was foot and mouth disease, for example, which I think I'm pretty sure a pig can get, then no, it wouldn't have affected the lion. So it really does depend on the disease, Katie. I thought I may have seen something in this tree, but of course when you're looking for a leopard, you see one under every branch. Right, let's have another stop and sniff. I'm just not lightheaded now for doing all this. <laughs> Have you heard Vian there? He said he's feeling very lightheaded from all of the inhalation of oxygen. No, I can't smell anything further around here. Now, unfortunately, after rain like this, unless we have a truly spectacular confirmed sighting, we're not going to be driving off road. So while I wouldn't mind going sort of driving in there to have a look see, um, I can't do that at the moment, I'm afraid. Right. Let's continue slowly up this way. I might go and have a poke about there on foot just now. Now, Susan in Los Angeles, uh, you're an astute safari goer and you want to know the difference between a warthog and a bush pig. Um, well, they're both pigs, obviously, so that's not a difference. But the one is 
I mean, the major difference is the diet that they eat. And bush pigs are very rare up here. We do get them. But a bush pig is a completely omnivorous animal. So it will eat lots of meat, quite a lot. It'll eat fruit, it'll eat grass, it'll eat roots and tubers and that sort of thing. Because a warthog is a vegetarian. Although a warthog can sometimes be seen eating from a from carrion or chewing on a bone or two, they are largely vegetarian. Then a bush pig is a kind of, uh, it looks like a wild boar. It's a very hairy, uh, reddish color with a bit of a white mane on the back. And the warthog is obviously just that plain gray color. So those are the major differences. We don't get them around here. They're very similarly sized. Now, I say we don't get them. They have been seen here once or twice, but not, not much. I think we might find ourselves coming back into this area just now, just to see. All very quiet on the radio at the moment. I don't smell anything further at this stage. There's a thank you. Look at the little... I'm just listening to the radio while you look at those Franklins. Apparently there was some sound of lions calling. I'm just going to switch off here and listen for a while. That, of course, is a crested Franklin the most common Franklin species that we get here. One of five. All right, let's quickly go across to the hyenas. They are out. We have to get here quickly because this hyena cub is out without any of the adults, and I think he is gone. Yeah, back into the den side. All seems to be really quiet at the hyena den. The shuffle for... Oh, hold on, hold on. I'm speaking very softly. Come on, baby. It's okay. It's all right. One of the madam's cubs. So brave enough to come and investigate all on its own, but definitely not going too far away from the den site itself. Little one. You're very brave. Hmm? Don't often see hyena cubs outside of the den without one of the adults present. Unless there is an adult around here somewhere, just maybe a little way off from the den. Little, little guy, where'd you go? You're gone, hiding. Hiding all the way. There's been a lot of buffalo activity around this den site. There's lots of tracks around here, lots of zebra tracks as well. And that's probably what sent the hyenas off on their way. The cubs have gone to ground. I can't imagine it's too comfortable down there at the moment, which is maybe why this cub is outside. It could be a bit damp and a bit cold. Unless maybe they've got some tunnels that will be sheltered from the water runoff. Sorry, I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel. Bear with me one moment. We just got a report from Andrew over the Game Drive channel, Andrew from Cheetah Plains, and that is that there are lions calling. We've heard lions to the south, of, almost due south of where we are now, quite close to the corner of Juma and Arethusa. We also thought he heard lions calling more towards Twin Dam side, which we've come all along. But that could well be the Inkahumas. I know. Sorry, just listening to James now as well. He's just checking up. I think he's also going to be following up on those lion calls. And since there's no hyena activity here, I think we're going to leave. And we'll travel down in Parlor Plains towards where Andrew heard the first set of calls. And I'm sure James will investigate on his side. I actually don't want to be here for too long if the cubs want to come out without the mothers around. I don't want to stress them out or cause an extra distraction, or in fact, even cause them to come too far out of the den site to investigate us without adult supervision, especially on a wet, windy day like today. Just better play it safe rather than sorry. And we'll leave them for now. Now, 
I think the joke will probably investigate the smell that he picked up on around the Mawati. I would be very... I wouldn't be surprised at all, to be phrased it that way, if the Inkahumas managed to kill last night. On a windy evening, dark and cold, they were hungry. They were very hungry looking. And the lioness that Brent was with, he had one of the Inkahuma lionesses, Amber Eyes, calling to the rest of the pride. She was also apparently looking like she could use a good meal. And the... Oh, beautiful there, Brian. Sorry. Don't want to stab you in the bottom with a monkey orange. The female that was missing from the group when James had them around Buffles with Dam, so not Amber Eyes, but one of the other females, she, I think it was her, looked even skinnier than the rest of them. So they would have been constantly moving last night on the hunt, looking for a meal. Thanks, Andrew. I'm coming to join you in that area. Awesome. So the guys at Arethusa have just let us know that there is a male lion wandering across the power lines on Triple M as we speak. He's, al he's already crossed onto Juma, so they've lost visual of him, but he's come straight through on the power lines. So we can head across there. Sorry, Zebra, I'm going to ignore you for the moment. Uh, he's obviously calling to other lions, and he could well be calling to the Inkuruma lionesses. Uh, I really appreciate the updates. I haven't seen the Birmingham boys in months. So yesterday when I saw that one male, I had absolutely no idea as to who it was, except that it was a Birmingham boy. And Sarah, who is one of our viewers in Ohio, and she's been keeping very much up to date with the various lines out here, she just wanted to let me know that it was Birmingham boy number two and not Blondie, as was originally suspected. And I, I sort of went with the Blondie as it was one of the suggestions, and he looked quite big. But of course, if I haven't seen them in months, they've been doing some considerable, sorry, millipede, I missed him, considerable growing in, during that time. So he just looked a little bit larger than I expected. So it was Birmingham boy number two. Hmm, he needs a better name, I think. I have to find out. I know that there's, there's Blondie and Scrapper, and there's the Hoff. One of them has nick been nicknamed the Hoff, but I'm still not entirely sure which one, as in David Hasselhoff, by the way. I'm still not entirely sure which one that is, in terms of the five of them. The Birmingham boys, for those uninitiated to the lions of this area, are a coalition of five young, youngish males that have just in recent months taken over this area as their territorial zone. They appear to have split, but they split and come together and split and come together into a three, a, a group of three and then a pair changes it's very fluid with lions once they establish their territory and when they're in a big coalition with plenty of members to help defend the territory keep your eyes peeled i don't think he's going to come up this way i think he's going to go straight towards where the Inkahumas are might be worth james listening in that area as well i'm sure he will be doing that just having a good listen to see if they call which is pretty much close to where we left them last night
copy that. Thanks, Andrew. I'm just making my way from main access now. I'll come south along Impala Road. Just double checking with Andrew exactly what that update was. And apparently there was a female, from what I can understand, the comms are a little bit unclear, but from what I can understand, there was a female with them as well. Let's just keep our eyes peeled here. I'll go nice and slowly. I know that James has been investigating the smell. So while I go and investigate and see where these lines have gone, let's find out, let's find out if James has identified the cause of it. Well, everybody, it would appear that the human being can, in fact, track with his, no, or her nose, indeed. There is the expired warthog, I, th I assume, from yesterday. We're in and around that area, and what I find it fascinating is that she's been left not quite untouched, but certainly unfinished. So, I mean, she's been mauled to the extent that I can't tell whether that's the sick one or not. I think it's very likely. I think she used to live in this termite mound right here with her youngster. I wonder if the youngster wasn't eaten. And maybe there's something in her, that sickness that made her so skinny and so rank, perhaps made her very distasteful as well. But something has got to be particularly putrid for a hyena not to want to eat it. Of course, during the rain like we had last night and the wind, it'll be difficult for a hyena to pick up and pinpoint something like that. So maybe a hyena will come across here and eat it uh, when it warms up or, you know, as that flesh starts to rot even further. Anyway, I think that's enough of being around here, this smelly warthog. Very exciting news about the lion that uh, potentially we're going to see, well, Jamie will see, uh, with you. And the, just to give you an update, there were four males calling to the south of us now. So I'm sure they're listening to those males. Maybe that male will call and just let his brothers know where he is. I think it's quite interesting, though, that so often it's four Birmingham males and one of them on his own. And it seems to be quite often a different one on his own. So I don't know the one to see a, uh, is the one with that scarred face, because he's the one that we see quite often on his own. It'll be very fascinating to see. So we're going to go down towards Twin Dams, and then just head slightly more to the west, and see if we can't pick up tracks of the rest of the Inkuhuma Pride. I'm not convinced that they are not still on this reserve. It is also amazing to me how the elephants have totally disappeared. So we have... We have a situation where yesterday you couldn't shake a bush without an elephant streaming out from behind it. The day before as well. Now, not an elephant in sight. Where they've gone, I couldn't tell you. Are they hiding in the thick bush? Maybe. Have they gone off somewhere else? Quite possibly. There are no tracks of them anywhere, so they've obviously flown away wherever they have gone. But it is fascinating that after all this time that I've been out here, I still couldn't vaguely tell you where the elephants go when the weather's like this, or where indeed most of the other animals go when the weather's like this. excavated burrows that are termite mounds. Deanna, they don't, I'm sure they do from time to time, but it's not like, I'm assuming you're thinking of perhaps horses. And I know that when I used to ride horses, you had to be out riding, that you can step in a rabbit burrow or perhaps an artifact hole, because of course a horse can then break its leg. I'm sure it must happen from time to time. Termite mounds, no, not an issue, I wouldn't say. I would definitely say that artfark burrows, though, could be an issue. So artfark will often not just excavate termite mounds, they'll excavate ant nests, which are not above ground, and so they can leave holes, which are quite difficult. I mean, over the, over the years, there's holes kind of fill in, and then you can stand on them, and the ground will subside, and it can cause nasty injury if you happen to be running at a great speed. 
but not inside termite mounds, no. I think that's highly unlikely. Remember, termite mounds are built of, I mean, it's almost concrete-like stuff. It really is very hard indeed, and it's one of the reasons that only an artfark is able to open them up and feed from termites initially. Once the artfarks open them up, of course, then lots of other things will go and eat termites. The most voracious predator of termites, of course, are ants. Ants love to eat termites. They're very nasty of them. I always feel very sorry for them because it seems that the ants always have one up on the termites. Despite the soldiers and their fearsome looking mouth parts, now, many of you would have seen them biting into my skin as I sacrificially gave of my skin for the school drive. I thought that was very nice of me, don't you, Vian? Yes, of course. Yes. didn't hear what I said there. He just said, yes, of course, as a matter of course. And <laughs> it amazes me how ants don't seem to be affected by those pincers at all. They go in there, three or four to a soldier termite, wipe them out, and then they go in and steal the young termites. And I've never seen a termite win the battle against the ants. It's always the ants that seem to be a very successful Viking raiding party. I have a children's, um, children's show coming up in my mind, uh, the um, Ragnar the Ant. Hello, Matthew. You are nine years old and you're remembering Scott and his special ultraviolet torch that he had at night to find scorpions. And you want to know if any of us have one. Matthew, um, I don't have one, no. Brent has got one, I think, and Steph's also got one. So we will certainly be looking for scorpions during the course of the next few nights. Fear not, we will try and match up to Scott's fearsome ability to find scorpions. Whether we will succeed, I don't know. One can only live in hope, Matthew, but certainly we're going to try. Right, we're going now to the south of the reserve to see what we can find there. You can see that the gloominess of the day is uh, now becoming quite a lot darker than it was earlier. Just always good to stop and listen on a day like this, or any day really. See if you can hear any alarm calls. And the bird calls. The birds, of course, are completely silent. But what you can hear if you listen very carefully is the sound of a frog. You won't hear it. It's too far. Let's go towards Treehouse Dam. I know that Jamie has been there, not too far from there, but I wonder if there's the frog calling from there. I don't think I've put the frog from there. I'm sure there's a puddle around here where there's a frog calling. But there will be some frog activity. Now, we've had almost no frog activity this summer, which has been a bit sad. But it would be very nice to have some frogs. Pamela, you want to know what happens to all the animals during a really bad flood. Pamela, remember that, I mean, if we had a really bad, bad flood, if Liam just pans off to the left there, if we had a really bad flood, I mean, this area wouldn't be affected. It, it's nowhere near a major river. It's nowhere near a major drainage system. Uh, while it might wash away, say, Treehouse Dam, which is not fed by it, but it is fed by this drainage line, but the other side of it, it might wash away the dam, but the animals will just get away and go to sort of higher ground, and they'd be fine. I think it would hardly affect them at all. You know, the animals living closer to the really big rivers, uh, crocodiles and hippos actually are affected by floods far more than, say, impala or nyala or any of the other animals that can move away from the rivers very quickly. Remember, the rivers, when they come down in flood here, they come down at an incredible speed. They come very fast. And so animals can get caught in them. 
especially if they happen to be largely aquatic, which crocodiles and hippos are. But most of the other animals will just come up onto a uh, sort of ridge crest area like this, grin and bear the cold and the rain, and then they'll be fine. Thank you, Paola, for that. Right, here we are at Treehouse Dam, where there is absolutely nothing going on at all. I think we'll just stop here and have a listen, see if we can hear those froggies. Sean, while we... While you look at the water there, you want to know how many millimetres of rain we had. We had 68 millimetres of rain. Now, that's quite a lot. That's almost four inches, which is a substantial amount of rain. And I'm sure that this dam... This dam, I don't believe the drainage line flowed. I'm sure this is just holding water. It's so silent out here. There's just a gentle breeze blowing. But otherwise, it is completely silent. <laughs> it won't be as soon as the sun comes up. And again, Zoe, nice question. Did we hear any crickets after the rain in the morning? No, we didn't, because remember, this cold front has made everything quite chilly. Crickets, insects, of course. And they will need a bit of heat to get themselves going again. And so when the heat comes, then we will start to hear the crickets again and a lot of the other insects. So normally we'd have a, like an afternoon thunderstorm and it would be warm as soon as it sort of it cleared off and there'd be stars out and then you'd have lots of crickets because it'd be a bit warmer. But this is a kind of really heavy front that's sitting down on us. It almost feels like we're driving through the cloud here. So, not much in the way of crickets. And we're expecting some more rain. And we were chatting to Michael Grover, who is the ecologist for the area. And he said that the storm, there's a large storm, was a large storm over Pretoria about two and a half hours ago. And that normally will take between six to 10 hours to get from Pretoria, which is the capital of South Africa, all the way down here to the low felt. So, I mean, that was at, what was that? That was about three o'clock, no, four o'clock. So 10 hours after that, we're looking at, brief, 10 hours from four o'clock take us to two o'clock this morning. Okay, let's go across to Jamie and Bahai. Here goes a hyena walking away into the bushes. Now, when I first saw him, he came dashing out from my right. And I'm just wondering whether, because we've come to exactly where the lion would, in theory, have popped out. I wonder if he's not running away from the presence of the lion. Let's go check. So Andrew and I have both been looking. Originally, the lion was calling. The male lion was calling repeatedly as he walked across the road. He was coming in this direction. Oh, the rain's coming. Now, I've just got an update as well that the Nkuhumas are on Simbambili. So that is where they are. There's rain streaming in to the east of us. It's coming. It's coming our way rapidly. Um, James is... I think it would be a good idea if James started making his way in this direction as it is. Maybe he can come and help us check the western edge of quarantine while we drive along Zoe's road. Let's just double check and see if this lion hasn't popped out somewhere around here. Keep your eyes peeled. Yes, so the, Inca, the Inca Umas are on Simbambidi. They were found earlier this afternoon. I don't think they have a kill, but I could be completely wrong about that. It was just a little bit of an update that we received. But there was a male with a male walking across in this direction. It sounds as though they found four Birmingham boys around Ingwe Marty, which is further to the southwest of us. Oh, we've just got to see if this male... The hyena was in a, in a hurry. Let's put it that way. He jogged a little bit and then did the sort of the standard run, the, the, far, or the fast walk that hyenas often do when faced with lions. Let's just see. All eyes peeled, many eyes better than one. 
Where are you, boy? Let's see if we can't get a glimpse before the rain sets in. There's that sudden drop in temperature. And on a cool day like today, lions can move about at any time of the day. All of the normal, all of the normal rules, rules in inverted commas, go straight out of the window. You get all manner of animals wandering about. That's odd. We would have heard them. So he hasn't passed through here. And you don't miss with an impala's eyesight. Impala will see a lion coming at 100 meters through the bush. And they haven't made a peep. So maybe I was mistaken about the hyena running away from a lion. I'm almost certain with this number of impala around, we would have heard them alarm calling. The update was that the lion was walking along the power lines. I've checked all along the power lines. There aren't any tracks that I can see on the road, but in life like this, I could well have missed them. Let's just keep checking. I'm just, I've left power lines now. I stopped there for quite a long time to listen to see if he was calling again. I'm now on Zoe's road, so a little bit further to the east. Essentially what I've done is worked my way along in a grid to see if I could jump ahead. He's cutting through the block. I'm restricted to the roads. So I've been doing a sort of a, a grid-like pattern to try and get ahead of him, wherever he may be. Now, a lion walking at a normal pace, or if he is striding to go and meet the rest of his coalition, he could be walking even faster. They can cover ground far faster than you ever expect them to. I've been caught out once or twice before trying to predict exactly where a lion's gonna come through the bush and out of a block, even when I know exactly where they've gone in. Could well come out somewhere here. It would be very nice if he would call for us at some point now. Uh, Juliet is watching and saying that she is surprised by the quiet and silence of the bush and she said it's always characterized as a place that is always or seems to be characterized as a place that is always noisy. And Juliet, first of all, the bush is a lot quieter this summer than any other summer I've experienced, just in terms of insect noise. But no matter how noisy the bush ever gets, and it does occasionally, you've got crickets calling or birds chirping away, no matter how noisy it does get, there is this deep and profound silence underneath that, that surface level of noise that is almost indescribable. Here comes the rain. And it's something that I always say, or I always try and make my guests enjoy. Wherever we happen to be, I stop the vehicle, turn it off, and just let them listen to that sound. We don't have the, the city, the typical city noises, and you won't believe how accustomed you come to the sound of traffic. And what, a, what an aspect that plays in the, the noises that you hear. At the moment, though, on cloudy days, on cloudy, rainy days like today, it does become incredibly noisy. Oh, sorry, not incredibly noisy, the exact opposite. It does become much quieter. Moon is picking up as well. Might need to put my cap on just to keep the rain out of my eyes. Brian, do you want to put your... Yeah, we need to put our rain cover on as well. Brian sort of balanced the rain cover precariously on the top, so forgive us. We're just going to stop so that we can do that. Would you like the skirt that goes around that? And while we do that, and while I put my cap on so that I can see in the rain, you can jump on the back of James's vehicle because his rain cover's already on. My rain cover is on, everybody, but Viam's is not quite on yet. He is just quickly putting it on behind us, and then we will be off into the squall, a thick, 
scotch mist has descended upon the low felt. We're very afraid of rain out here, of course. We're not used to it. Bjorn, are you ready? Oh, hear me, this hood is a bit ridiculous. But it does hide my bald spot, of course. Kirsten, how are the sound levels? I'm not sure what they're like within my, uh, within this. Oh, good, you can hear me. Sound wonderful, of course. Marvelous. Now, Leo Pad, this is the million dollar question, of course. Liam, what on earth are you doing, man? My roll of toilet paper. Your roll of toilet paper. No, this is the not thing. the time for that. Oh, I see you want to wipe the lens. Right, okay. Um, yeah, you can use my hat. <laughs> Leo Pad, while we drive along, I'm going to get a little bit closer to home, just in case that this squall doesn't abate. Um, you want to know about whether or... Oh, there we go. Le Liam's found his loop paper. Um, <laughs> you want to know if the grass is going to have a chance to get tall or not. Uh, Leo Pad, we're in March. Now, even if we get into winter and we have a flash of rain, so sometimes there is a flush of green. But that is normally so that the plant can build up carbohydrate reserves, not so that it can put up the columns or stalks on which the inflorescence and seeds will grow. So no, I don't think the grass is going to get tall at all. I think that it is going to become green and it will become a bit thicker and spread out of it, but I don't think it's going to put up or um, expend the energy to make the seeds. Remember, to make seeds and to make the stalks that the seeds go on is very expensive for the grass plant and can only do that if it's built up sufficient reserves. The only way it can build up sufficient reserves is if it's got uh, leaves, which in turn will, it will use to gather carbohydrates in the underground storage systems in the plant. I mean, you can't believe how fascinating actually a grass plant is, but for most of you, you'll be yawning immediately and going to sleep. But for those who aren't, a grass plant is actually a fascinating thing, and you will find that Despite the fact that we have had lots of rain now, I really don't think that they're going to have built up sufficient reserves to, there's a kudu, to put up the seeds and culms. Hello, kudu. Gee, this is a big fellow. Look at him. Isn't he wonderful? Look at this beautiful kudu ball. The other thing you'll notice about these kudu, as Steph pointed out to me the other day, is that their necks are getting very thick. And their necks are getting very thick because they are too going into the rut, their rut, which isn't quite as obvious as the impala rut, but it is going to happen. And I think you'll also find that's why they are so confiding at the moment. They're prepared to walk past us. They're not that worried about going past us, normally they'd run away. But today, he seems to be completely happy about it, and I suspect it's because he's inundated with testosterone. Now, uh, Vian, where's my hat? I don't believe that this hood is working for me. You've lost my hat, haven't you? Sorry, everybody, we'll be with you in one second. Here we go. Yeah, would you pan off me? I don't want people to be blinded by my bald spot there. You see how cleverly I did that? Nobody saw anything. As far as they're concerned, I have the hair of Scott Dyson and Novak Djokovic. Right, on we go. Of course, my lapel mic is now hidden underneath my jacket because it can't get wet. And so you may have to, you may struggle to hear me, but I will try and talk into the back microphone and then it will be fine. Uh. Hello, Rusty Pipe. Resident comedian for the day. Rusty Pipe, you say we shall soon see the white crested lens cleaner and that, of course, will be Viam's loo paper as he cleans the lens in this little squall, which seems to be abating somewhat. Now, the lions 
Apparently, we're around the western edge of quarantine. I suspect that they might come out into the open as it starts to get a bit darker, much as they did yesterday. So we'll go up there and see what we can find. Hello, Deanna. You want to know about lions calling, and if a male lion calls, will he be calling to try and get hold of the female, or is he, going to, is he calling his brothers? What is he doing? A male lion's call is for two reasons. One, to contact other members of the coalition. So yes, he would want to contact the other members of the coalition, but largely it's for territoriality. So they do it when they are trying to mark territory. You won't call a female like that. Uh, lions, when they call, make a contact call, it's a much softer noise. Um, and likewise with a female, they will only roar when they are being territorial. They won't want, want to roar to attract the attentions of males. Largely, they don't want the attentions of males because males are just a drain on resources unless they happen to be mating. Thank you, Diana. Right, we're approaching quarantine clearings now. Into the squall we go bravely. I mean, it's not raining very hard, everybody. It's just kind of drizzling a bit. But I think it will rain a bit harder a bit later. Ah, now, Alice, you're in Ohio, and we saw that big kudu bull, and I, I keep doing this. I keep saying, well, you know, that was a big kudu, or that was a small kudu, and of course, on the screen, it's very difficult to tell the difference. A kudu will stand, you want to know how high he stands at the shoulder. A kudu will probably stand about six feet at the shoulder, so just a bit taller than me. But yeah, about six feet at the shoulder, just under two meters. So quite tall. Right, <laughs> Jamie has got a unicorn to show you. have a unicorn. Is it Nelson or is it not? Oh, no, wrong side, boy. He's looking up to the north of him. I wonder if they're not other impala alarm calling. I'm just listening for a second before I reposition. I can't tell if it's him or not. There are more than, there is more than one one-horned impala on Juma. There's a, oh, no, he turned. No. Come back, Impala. Come back. Don't go. Don't go before you've turned around. Oh. Don't stop there either. That's exactly the wrong spot. Hey, you. <laughs> Turn your head, boy. Let's find out if you really are Nelson. Look how he's looking intently up in the direction that I have just come from. It could be that he's listening to alarm calls. Come on, Impala, turn your head. Except that you're behind the bush, so there's a chance we won't see your eye if you turn your head. Oh, the anticipation is killing me. Could it be? Will we know? I can't off-road. No, wrong, wrong direction. Yes, is it him? I think it's him. That looked like a damaged eye to me. briefest moment. It didn't look like a normal impala. Uh, no, it is a normal impala eye. Never mind. Not Nelson, just just a one-horned impala. The excitement, and after all that, as we sit in the rain and wonder what he was looking at, it was just one other one-horned impala, not Nelson the one-horned, one-eyed impala, not to be confused with any of the other one-horned impala on the reserve. That was surprisingly tricky to say. Let me just turn my lights on here as we carry on into the drizzle. Whoopsie. Now it's a little bit chilly this morning, as I'm sure Brian can attest to. And one of the wonderful um, 
one of the wonderful things about this rain cover of ours is that it redirects the water very carefully away from all of our expensive equipment to my general sitting area. <laughs> so whoever happens to be driving winds up with a slightly damp, not to put it too, get, too delicately, bottom. And it's an important way of redirecting the water to where it can't actually do any damage because we are fairly waterproof as people. Up oh, there it is. There we go. And it's a bit chilly, but not nearly as chilly as it gets in winter. And Kathleen, or Kathy was wondering, how cold does it get in winter? And do we still see snakes at that time of year? And the answer is it gets very, okay, for us personally, I think we have a slightly skewed temperature scale, but it does seem to get really, really chilly. We start to shiver but it's also the fact that we're in open vehicles so the wind chill factor probably takes about eight degrees off whatever temperature it happens to be so it can it can get to close to zero in Fahrenheit um, in centigrade which is 32 in Fahrenheit so it can get fairly chilly first thing especially since we're usually up and about before the Sun peeks over the horizon that being said, our summer, our winter days are probably the equivalent of summer in quite a few European countries and maybe some North American countries as well. Uh, they reach up to 25, 26, which puts it in the mid 70s Fahrenheit. So the days get fairly warm and what that means for our snake population is that although they go into a period of what is known as Easterbation, where their metabolism slows down, they also are able to come out of that at times when it gets nice and warm and they'll come out and bask particularly around the the roads where they've got nice unimpeded they've got unimpeded access to the sun they'll come out and bask then so we do still see snakes they're not nearly as numerous as they would be in the summer months but they are around we don't see frogs however not many and generally the tortoise sightings are fairly limited in terms of reptiles. The, the skinks and the lizards and the, uh, the geckos, they tend to hang around. They're active throughout the winter. We, don't, we also don't see chameleons as frequently. And speaking of chameleons, I'm just going to reach under and get my little spotlight out. Oh, oh, there's some dripping happening here. Sorry, hold on. I need to just rescue the radios. They've managed to find their way into the puddle that hasn't been deflected by my backside. Oh dear. Oh dear. Don't do that. Please don't drop in the water. Let's pop you in here. Stay there. Okay, don't stay there. Stay there instead. Oh no, this isn't going well at all. Everybody, hold on. Stand by. Everything's so slippery. There we go. Got it. It's a bit damp this afternoon, which of course is wonderful. How are you getting on there, Brian? Are you, are you enjoying yourself? <laughs> Every now and again, Brian is going to have to act as your windscreen wipers, since the camera lens has not yet come with a windscreen wiper attachment. decided to disappear off to. In the winter months, I generally find myself at the, in the summer, I go out in just, a, in just my um, work shirt and my shorts. In winter, I will have, if on a really cold day, I may have stockings on, shop and horror, underneath my trousers combined with a shirt and then probably two layers of jumpers plus a jacket plus gloves and a scarf and a beanie at which point i feel something like that what is that marshmallow monster in ghostbusters I feel something akin to that but you do get a serious wind chill factor involved and even i've said that we feel cold more acutely than perhaps those from colder climes might but I've had guests come from Sweden, from the UK, sorry, Guru, from all walks of slightly colder climates, and even they suffer in winter. They have not suffer, but they definitely have to wrap themselves up in blankets. The game drive vehicles always come with blankets when you go out in safari in winter. 
and that coffee break becomes a very welcome reprieve. That being said, winter is an amazing time to see the less, less often seen mammals. already given the drought that it's starting to look more and more like autumn okay now it's raining so we're going to have another green flush but the bush willow leaves have already started changing color and started going that orangey color of autumn and Pamela was wondering how long until the leaves start changing color Pamela we don't get the same bright vivid array that you might in the northern hemisphere in those sorts of areas autumn south africa doesn't really do two seasons we do two i mean four seasons we do two seasons with a minor transition period in between and really the only leaves that change color immensely are the bush willow leaves they start to go a ready orange browning color but beyond that most of our leaves slowly dry out and drop off a lot of the trees here are evergreen for example the guari bushes are evergreen the marula trees also don't tend to have as dramatic a color change they just slowly start to gray and then drop off but that will be happening over the course because it's happening earlier this year i would say over the course of the next two months depending on how much rain we actually get at the moment most of the leaves are gone by about June. And June is when the really cold weather starts to properly set in. Still way to go yet, although I've noticed a serious, I know James was probably talking about this earlier, serious drop in the usual bird species, the migratory bird species that can still be calling in this region in a normal year. Winter is an amazing time because then you get the smaller nocturnal animals coming out earlier and earlier. The things like art fox, and the only time I've ever seen a pangolin, sorry, the, the first time I ever saw a pangolin was in midwinter. So it's a wonderful time to see the smaller, lesser seen creatures out and about earlier than expected. I'm going to continue on my search for this male lion. I'm sure he's, I'm really keeping fingers crossed he's going to pop out on quarantine kindly for us. In the meantime, let's find out how Mr. Hendry is enjoying our current downfall. Paul, not downfall, downfall. I think downfall is a slight exaggeration. I don't think it's quite a downfall yet, but it's certainly building. And uh, Viam said to me as we were driving along, he said, it's going to build and build until it becomes super rain. So I said, Viam, what is a super rain? And he said, you know, like last night when it was going on our roofs. I said, yes, I, I, I know. He said, that is super rain. If it does become like that, everybody, we will have to pack it in and go home. It would be very nice to find some kind of a large predatory cat that has been the objective of the afternoon but so far they have eluded us Viam, there is a bush baby in here i saw its eyes flashing flashing eyes i saw a wet bush baby but it is gone it has decided better of being out in this weather quite clever of it really don't you think Viam? Yes. 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 Ah, it's fine. The weather is easing off now. Not so wet. Just a little bit wet. Okay, our plan now, we do actually have a plan, believe it or not, is to head towards Gallagher Waterhole. See if there's anything there. I'm not really sure why anything should be there, but it's a good point of call. And then we're going to go past Jumadam and back up onto quarantine because I've got a feeling that those lions are going to pop out somewhere around there. I'm not sure why or how they were lost in the first place. I think they, if they ran away, that's very unusual behavior. But I'm not sure what happened. 
because, of course, lions are not prone to running away from vehicles unless they're new to an area. And I would be very surprised if they were new. Right, we're now to the pan. Where there is, Vian, yeah, what do you see? What do you see? Um, yeah. Dead tree and a, a, a dead tree and a water hole. Well done. Excellent. Very good observational skills there. I also see rain coming out of the sky. Not much in the way of chameleons. They will be hiding. <laughs> much in the way of <laughs> anything, really. find an interesting tree to look at. Well, of course, one of the interesting things about rain like this is that a... Oops, the door just opened. It nearly fell out. We nearly had high action there, Vian. Uh, one of the things about rain is that it, it causes erosion. And erosion, of course, is a major problem the world over. And it creates soil loss. And what it means is that when it's wet like this, we won't drive off road unless there is in the right unless it's in the right area. So on a ridge crest where the soils are very well drained. So if we saw a leopard in there, for example, we couldn't go driving off from there now. But if we find something on quarantine, then we can do that. And one does have to take cognizance, I think, of the ecology of an area like this. Although, as we were chatting around the fire the other day, oops, we were staying, Steph and I were saying, you know, human beings have been around so little time and we are so concerned about, or some of us are so concerned about the effects that we might be having on the environment by putting roads in the wrong place or perhaps putting water here or not putting water there. And in, as far as human history or as far as world history goes, I don't think we're going to have much of an effect on this area at all. Once we are gone, in however many hundreds of thousands of years from now, this place will revert to what it was before without us. And so while we may have a fairly heavy impact while we're here, in the greater scheme of history, I think our effect will be almost negligible. There is a scrub here. Don't run away, please. You're the only thing I've seen. Please don't run away. No, gone. Oh well. Now Zoe, you want to know about predators that might move around at night and hunt and kill in the night. Zoe, there are just about all the predators will enjoy these kind of conditions because it's very difficult for animals to smell them. This kind of weather will dampen the smell of predators. It's also very difficult, it makes, the wind makes it difficult for predators, to, at least for prey, to hear approaching predators. And obviously the darkness and the lack of a moon or starlight makes it very difficult for prey animals to see the predators. And so, yes, this is very good weather for predators. We we'll all like to hunt in this. It also warms them up a bit, of course, to be hunting out in weather like this. Lions and cats in particular don't enjoy the wetness. All right, apparently we have uh, been told that we're, we're going to close the show now. So I uh, thank you for your interactions with me this afternoon. Thank you, Vian, for your patience in the weather. Uh, we're going to make our way home to the dry, and we'll see you tomorrow during the dawn light. Oh, well, it might be a bit of a misty dawn, really, at 05.30. Until then, um, stay safe and dry wherever you happen to find yourself in the world. We're finishing off our sunset safari slightly early, but the rain is coming down and it's getting a little bit damp in this vehicle. Desperately trying to rescue all electronic equipment that I can. But I do have a quick update for you. There was a brief sighting of a Karula on Philemon's cut line around Shabum Road by Andrew, that was called in by Andrew. 
Um, no cubs with her at the moment, he, and he's left the sighting. But she is around, she is in the area, so a nice little update on our much beloved leopard. And on that note, I'm going to bid you all a good evening. Big thank you to Brian for all of his fantastic camera work and for sitting with me in the rain. And as always, a thank you to you, the lovely viewers, for your questions and comments and joining us on this damp afternoon. And as well to the lovely ladies, Kirsty and Jerry, who are sitting in FC. We will catch you all tomorrow for the Sunrise Safari, depending on, of course, whether or not it is pouring with rain. But we'll keep our fingers crossed and we'll keep you updated. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world. And we'll catch up with you tomorrow. Cheers.